Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I want to welcome you to our lecture with Fernando Moraes from Pearson, Brazil. He's going to be talking about thriving with technology. Will chaos finally get the best out of us? And uh, before you ask, uh, during the lecture, we'll be leaving the link for you to download the certificate down here on the video description. Now, please welcome Fernando Moraes. Thank you so much for your introduction, Barbara. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And thank you all for coming for this uh, talk. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about the theme that, that uh, uh, I, I came out with, uh, I came with to talk to you about today. Thriving with technology, guys. So uh, can you all, see my screen everything okay barbara we can just move on right um so guys for us to get started i would like to share the agenda for the day with you and we're going to talk about uh the times we're in the fourth industrial revolution and then we're going to talk about some topics, the relationship between innovation and education, the new normal we're living, effects of the pandemic. We'll talk about some trends and end with a silver lining, okay? So this is the agenda we have for the day. But I would like to start by hearing some of your ideas, guys. I would like to hear from you. Unfortunately, this presentation cannot be dialogic. I, I cannot have your voice here. But if I can't have your voice, I would like to have your opinion, your views, at least. And for that, uh, we're going to use a tool called menti.com. And this is going to be our poll number one of the day. So please, we're going to use your smartphones during this uh, talk. It can be any smartphone you have. We're talking about technology, right? So uh, I thought it would make sense to use it with you guys. So I hope you guys are ready. What you have to do is you have to go to menti.com and use the code 84946097, right? So that's uh, what you're going to do. I hope you are all doing that. And while you do that, uh, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to share another screen with you guys, right? Uh, I'm going to share uh, something else which is uh, the Mentimeter we're going to do. So have a look at this, right? So menti.com and use the code, right? Uh, so in your Mentimeter, you might be seeing uh, something like this. Which of these resources have you used in classroom, in your classroom as teachers? Um, I would like to know which of these uh, resources you have used in classroom. So please uh, select the ones you have used already. And we are going to see your votes in here, right? Um, oh, I think I probably did something. I could have done better. I could have... I should have let you use, choose more than one option. And I hope you can, but if you can only choose one, choose the one you use the most. We're going to see which of these you have used. Some people are voting and we, uh, and then we can see the number of votes by the little dots. So I think there is a large number of votes. There are a large number of votes for smartphones. Well, votes are coming. Please keep adding your uh, answers, your ideas, 
right? If you have used them, please just check. Wow, we have some clear winners here and smartphones is one of them. But a lot of people have used interactive whiteboards as well. Um, in second place, oh, there is a tie. Oh, now interactive whiteboards are ahead, but interactive whiteboards and notebooks are coming in second. Uh, but smartphones are a clear winner today. Wow. Uh, and then there is a tie between notebooks and interactive whiteboards. Right. So nobody here has used VCRs in class. Oh, my goodness. I think we have a young public today, a young crowd joining us. I have used... VCRs in my classrooms, and perhaps that tells you a little bit about my age. We had 102 votes, uh, and I think you have voted on the devices you have used the most in class. Uh, but two people here have used the language lab in school, and more people have used CDs or CD-ROMs. Wow, I can't believe. I think these are really things of the past. Huh? VCR, nobody here has used. CD-ROMs, nobody. Well, DVDs, quite a few people. But, wow, thank you for uh, contributing. Thank you for voting. I think uh, that tells a little bit about the kind of generation of uh, our public today. Thank you for sharing that. Well, um, now, uh, I'm going to keep um, talking to you, and we're going to start the presentation right now, okay, after our polling, time number one. I would like to share with you the first image, and I don't know, I honestly don't know if you recognize this. If you do, if you recognize this page, if you know where it comes from, can you please type it in the chat for me, please? Even though I cannot read the chat um, right now, just because I am uh, looking at my screen, at my screen, and I'm not, uh, I don't have both uh, views. But um, I don't know if you know where this is from, or if that sounds familiar to you. But this page comes from one of the first books I ever used for teaching. And it is Market Leader, right? The best-selling business English course uh, around the globe and in Brazil as well. Um, but when I taught that lesson many years ago, there was a quote that never, never got out of my mind. And it was the quote which is here in the bottom of the page. Market leader always brings a quote in here. And the new generation of market leader, which is business partner, does as well. Right? Bad ideas don't get better online. So when I thought about this presentation, I thought about this quote uh, a lot. Uh, we've all had to go to online teaching recently and it was quite an adventure last year to be honest right and uh, something we realized was that well um, of course there is a time for you to adapt but uh, bad classes don't get better online. <laughs> it's not because you're using technology that classes get uh, better automatically, much to the contrary. We're going to have a look at some things that uh, are part of this process of uh, teaching online and teaching with technology, okay? So uh, I know some of you may have been here last time I presented during Encontro de Férias in the second semester last year. So I am only briefly going to mention something I talked about that day. Uh, to say that we are in the fourth industrial revolution, and the first industrial revolution was the one of steam-based machines, 
um, factories powered by coal and productions, production being transported by uh, steam uh, trains. There was a second industrial revolution, which was uh, which happened mostly in England and made possible for the mass production of uh, icons of, of, of items, uh, increase the capacity, powers, working uh, people, dividing jobs differently in the factory. Um, every person doing a little bit uh, of the job, a part of the job. And then perhaps some of you may have been born during the third industrial revolution. And the third industrial revolution is familiar to us because we have lived in it or close to it uh, because it happened in the late 20th century. And it is also called the first information revolution. Uh, it was the revolution of computers and internet-based knowledge. Finally, the times we live in, and that's why I said we are in the fourth industrial revolution, because it's uh, happening right now. Artificial intelligence, information technology, uh, softwares, big data, the internet of things, and cloud computing as, as big ideas. Uh, and this, this all started in the early 21st century. We're still not too far in the 21st century yet, but basically these are the times we're in, right? And last time I also mentioned that education followed those trends. Perhaps there was education 1.0, uh, teacher-centered with uh, teachers only speaking and um, students remaining quiet in class. Then there was education 2.0, in which teachers would ask, would talk to students, and students would respond, would, would respond, sorry, but that was much more like regurgitating uh, content, uh, either in class or in tests. Students had to reproduce what teachers said, uh, sometimes verbatim, uh, to be considered right. So that was the second uh, educational revolution, and the, in, in it, we saw learners as rece re receptacles of um, knowledge, receiving only from their teachers. And then there was an Education 3.0, which uh, many of us have experimented, in which there were ideas of collaboration. Social networking was present already. The teacher would serve as a facilitator, perhaps the layout in classroom has changed. Um, students could work sometimes based in projects. Uh, they could work collaboratively, right? And now we're faced with uh, educations in our times, which is education 4.0. Uh, and 4.0 makes reference to that fourth industrial revolution, right? with industry 4.0. In other words, education 4.0 is the one that prepares learners for industry 4.0, right? And in it, we see the web as a curriculum, right? The whole web with uh, learners producing and sharing content with others. We saw that much more last year due to the pandemic open access to information, uh, to information learners making connections, having access to experts, and sometimes uh, working as teachers, right? Uh, being in the shoes of teachers, presenting what they have produced, and educators as resource guides, guiding students' learning. Right. Uh, I think that our people here from all areas of education, I hope so. Uh, but there might be a majority of language leader, uh, teachers here. And that's why uh, back then, the other time, I talked about a timeline of English teaching methods. And I'm only briefly going to discuss this. Education 1.0 was, uh, English teaching 1.0 was behaviorist, was structuralist. Uh, then there was a 2.0 which was more cognitivist and humanistic. And 
we evolved the, the English teaching methods are here. We started from grammar translation and direct method. We moved on to audio lingualism, even though those methods kept being um, used and they still are today, some of them. And we got to education in English language teaching 3.0, which was more communicative and interactionist, right? This, these were the times in which the word conversation would have to be used if you wanted new, new students. You would have to say that you teach conversation. That's communicative language teaching. And I know that uh, for many of us, this is still the most uh, current trend, perhaps. Our uh, teaching must be communicative. And the answer to this is yes, it has to be communicative. But we have evolved already as we entered uh, English language teaching 4.0. Uh, we have now, uh, more towards the end of the years uh, 2000, Principal decleticism. And what is eclecticism? It's a mixture. So it means we, we have the best things of each of these uh, trends of thoughts or um, psychology fields, right? We, used, we can use a little bit of what uh, one method uh, prescribed, something from the other method. We get the best out of each of them. Uh, to make principle the classicism. But this, this uh, talk here is not only about um, English teaching. It's about teaching with technology. Teaching with technology. So I was wondering, and um, I, I was reflecting a lot when I was preparing this, and um, it seems to me that the advances in English language teaching, the advancements in education as well, they were very much related to advances in the psychology of education uh, areas, of course, educational psychology. Uh, they had to do with advances in technology. As innovation evolved, these new methods became possible. Some of them would not be possible without some of these uh, advances in technology. In other way, in other words, these methods they have a lot to do with the times we live in, in terms of uh, uh, devices, in terms of uh, industry as well. So these things are all interconnected. And uh, I took the liberty to prepare perhaps the worst slide I've ever made here. Um, <laughs> It's so crammed, but uh, com uh, comparing English language methods and innovation. And back then, in the beginning of uh, the century, everything we had was, I don't know if you can guess what this is, but it is a radio, right? It's one of the first radios, which was invented in the 18th century, but only became popular. It only spread throughout uh, society in the beginning of, in the early 1900s. Newspaper, the printing was uh, the printing press was still um, an important issue, even though it's been there for a while. But that's why we have grammar translation because we had mostly printed text. And what can you do with printed text? You can translate. That's what you can do. And even though the telephone had been invented. Uh, in the end of the 19th century as well, it only became popular towards uh, the beginning of the 19th, of the 20th century. But it was mostly used for business-to-business -business communication. So it was impossible to think about uh, teaching based on uh, the telephone, basically. And then, uh, I don't know if you know what this is. It's not a microwave. It's a TV set. Then uh, the invention of television in the end, in the end of the 30s and the beginning of the 40s, uh, brought image to place. And I'll give you this is the one million dollar question: What is this? Believe it or not, it's a photo of the first computer, which was probably bigger than the room I'm talking to you from today, right? Which happened there, uh, right in the end of the 1940s, uh, right after the Second uh, World War, right? And then something that started affecting English language teaching, right? The cassette tape. And it's no surprise that audio, audio lingualism 
uh, comes about uh, around this time, right? Because now people could listen. They could hear uh, people from other places uh, talking, which was back then impossible. And then, okay, I don't know if you guess what this is, but this is the first mobile. This is the, the first uh, Motorola uh, telephone, which came about in the end of the 1970s. And then communication started to become more mobile. So it's the, the beginning of the possibilities of talking to people from um, long distances uh, by um, mobile devices. Uh, the Walkman, the first Walkman, then um, made uh, sounds portable and the possibility of, of hearing things on the go. And this was powered by the first personal computer, the first tablet, which was uh, which came to place in the end of the 1980s. To be more precise, in the in 1989, it's not a Steve Jobs invention, but I'll get back to it later the first tablet uh, invented by Palm Company. And then the CD, um, which had been invented in the 1980s, become popular in the 1990s. The World Wide Web, the first iPod in 2001, and the first smartphone in uh, 2000. So all these things have a lot to do with the methods we're talking about here. They make it possible to communicate and to teach in those ways. We're going to make, of course, this slide uh, just a little uh, cleaner for you to see. Um, but uh, a conclusion of all this is what um, Malcolm Gladwell uh, talks about, um, which is called the generation lag, right? Uh, I love my Malcolm Gladwell, professor from the University of Toronto. And one of his uh, ideas, one of his books is called The Tipping Point. And the tipping point, o ponto da virada in Portuguese, is the point in which things change in a dramatic way, right? And uh, what Gladwell argues is, uh, in, to a large extent, similar to, to, to what I'm saying to you. Many of those technologies we have seen, they only took place because the times were ready for them. And he gives some examples. Uh, he starts talking about his latest uh, book, uh, Talking to Strangers. Um, and he says that the book industry usually has these numbers uh, worldwide, 60% of printed books, 30% uh, of digital books, and 10% of other formats, including audiobooks. Well, something interesting happened uh, last time with uh, talking to strangers, Gladwell says. Uh, printed books were up a little bit. They were slightly up. And this is a more recent book. If I'm not mistaken, it's from 2018 or, or 19. Um, but um, so we were already living a digital transformation. And he was shocked because printed books were up a little because we think we're going digital, right? But digital books went down 40%. So the numbers went down 40%. And you know what happened? Audiobooks increased 400 or 500 percent. I'm sorry. So they sold five times more audiobooks than they used to sell before. Nowadays, audiobooks are outnumbering the sales of printed books by two times. So they sell two audiobooks and one printed books. Now, this is the rate things are going. But then he says the audiobook is not something new. It's a node thing. But there is some time it takes for uh, people to accommodate and to be able to use the technology and engage with it. And this thing happened with electric cars. I didn't know, but uh, Gladwell says the first electric car was invented in the end of the 19th century, around 1896. But they are still picking up and they still haven't yet reached their full potential. ATMs, for example, were uh, invented in the 1960s, but they only really picked up in the 1990s. 
in Brazil, they didn't even have a reason to exist before 1994 uh, when Real came about because our money would lose value from night to day. So there is no purpose in having a lot of money stocked in an ATM because the next day or the next week, it will be almost worthless with 80% of inflation per month, right? So uh, times were not ready for ATM back then when it was invented. Same thing with the VCR. Uh, TV companies thought the VCR would kill, simply kill uh, television back then. And nowadays we see that TVs are actually transforming themselves and going into streaming. If you think streaming is killing TVs, um, that's not exactly the way it goes. Uh, now, uh, movie industry, movie companies have their own uh, streaming platforms. Uh, televisions have their own streaming platforms. And streaming is being used to reproduce uh, what was in television back then. And it's being used as television was in the past with, with uh, of course, um, uh, relevant, significant differences because it's on demand, it's on the go, but TV companies are using it. And finally, Gladwell says that uh, Airbnb and Uber could not have come to be in the 1960s, for example, because the world was not ready for them. The world was not ready for a stranger to be in your car or for a stranger to be in your bedroom, in your house. Right. So uh, the technology evolves as society is ready for it and it affects education as society is ready for it as well. But the question of this uh, talk is, will chaos and I know by chaos, you, you probably know what I mean. Right. Uh, you, if you lived here into 2020, will will that all bring bring the best out of us? And I have spoken too much. You, you're probably finding this the most boring thing you have ever been to, the most boring talk. So it's time for another polling time. This way I stop talking and you have a chance to answer something. All right, so get your smartphones again. I want to hear from you guys. And please um, go back to mentimeter.com. I'm going to share my screen with you and I'm going to change the slide and you are going to see a new screen in your, oh, I have more uh, votes here, but smartphones are still reigning sovereign, right? The second question I have for you is this, using technology in class, right? I want you to read those statements and say how much you agree or disagree with them. So you have to vote. There is a slide there you have to give it a rate to how much you agree or disagree with those statements so please vote on your phones 31 people have voted already uh, many people enjoy using technology here uh, the second statement i avoid using technology when i can no many people do not um Avoid using technology, thank goodness. Um, technology in intimidates and threatens me, still uh, low numbers. We have quite a technological, tech-savvy audience here. But people still want to learn more about using technology in class. Okay, great. This is our highest number, even though numbers are still moving. No, enjoying using technology is the highest one. Uh, many people who think that technology in class takes up too much time. No, uh, less than half of the people think that. Majority of people think, no, the technology does not take too much time. Uh, the majority of people feel confident when it comes to using technology in class. Great. This is good to hear. It's a good sign. And the majority of people also say they would be a better teacher if they knew how to use technology better. I think I, I missed the word better in there. Right. Thank you. Almost more than 80 people have voted now. And uh, I like to do this because even though we cannot talk, uh, it's the way I, I feel I can hear from you guys. So 
thank you very much for sharing that. I know it takes some time to vote and there are many questions. So I will give you uh, one more minute for you to vote uh, on that, right? And while you finish uh, voting, let's see uh, if we, there is a, a dispute here in which, between people who enjoy using technology and people who want to learn more about, let's see which is the highest number here. It seems to be almost a tie. Okay, now that we have passed 100 votes, I think this is a very good picture. So my question would be how you interpret this. I see this as the group who's here. Look, 66 people who have given a number, a number five, the maximum grade to enjoying the use of technology. And 76 people said they want to learn more about the use of technology in class. Fantastic. And yeah, so this shows we, we are eager to, to use technology and to know more about it because we believe it will make us a better teacher. And most of us is confident about using technology in class. But some people still avoid it when they can. It still intimidates uh, some of us. So for those of you who feel intimidated and who avoid using technology, I hope uh, by the end of this talk, you will find some relief, right? I hope this will be useful for you somehow uh, because we're going to talk about the new normal now. Uh, well, chaos was there in the name and I don't have to tell you why uh, I mentioned chaos. But... Uh, I don't want to look only uh, uh, to the chaotic part of 2020. I want to look at the opportunities it brought. Uh, I know that when we talk about opportunities, and I want to make a point here, guys, I don't want to be naive uh, to think that the pandemic was great for education only, right? Some things that came from the news, uh, pretty recent news, a few months ago, 8.7 million students did not have access to remote teaching during pandemic. And in the north of Brazil, 40% of children from elementary school had no activities uh, up until July, right? So it's a staggering number, 8.7 million people. Wow, it's amazing. But then you will think, okay, but this is the north of Brazil, not in Sao Paulo. Well, it turns out that more than 1.5 million uh, children in Sao Paulo are still without school after nine months. Uh, th this is from January, right? 99% uh, of uh, elementary schools, the city schools, have not opened, and 48% of state schools were, sc were closed uh, since March. So it's a large number. And we're talking about the largest uh, state in the country, one of the largest cities in the world, in which uh, the government provided uh, SIM cards with internet access, a TV channel, an app, uh, booklets, and countless resources to help children study during this period. Still, 1.5 million people uh, were out of school. And from those uh, who, from all these students, only half of them could access the online classes and teachers were overloaded. So it's a staggering figure, not something to be proud of, despite all the efforts that were made by teachers, by the government. Um, and I know it was uh, a lot of, of effort. But 2020 then, for those who accessed those uh, live classes, those platforms, teachers who discovered new, new things, it was basically uh, a lot of unfinished, <laughs> unfinished projects, unfinished uh, lesson plans, unfinished teachers. Because in one day we were in school, the next day we had to teach online. But we were not ready for that. 
right? We hadn't prepared the classes for that unless you did that from night to day and you became an online teacher or almost a YouTuber the next day. I wasn't. I wasn't ready for that. And working from a publisher, I know that many platforms, uh, I don't want to talk about our own, but many platforms were unfinished projects that started being used the next day and people realized the flaws they had by using them. And uh, just for you to have another idea here uh, in Brazil, despite all that, now talking perhaps more about the private sector and uh, those in the public sector who had access to technology, uh, there was an increase of 140% of uh, downloads of educational apps. Brazil was third, coming only behind uh, Australia and the United Kingdom. Uh, we were ahead of the United States in downloads of educational apps. So people were consuming uh, techno tech devices and tools uh, in Brazil during that. Uh, many people started using the internet to do other things like shopping, for example. 53% here were more prone to shopping online than they were before. Uh, mobile app um, rankings, download rankings changed uh, dramatically, even though we see uh, that uh, Facebook dominates the list of the top 10. They have four of those uh, apps, but TikTok is number one. And two of those apps, I'm talking about the most downloaded apps in general, right? Not only uh, for education, but total. Two of those apps were for uh, education. Zoom, which was number two, and Google Meet, which was number seven. Despite the fact that Google Meet comes preloaded in most Android devices. I dare to say that if Google Meet was not embedded into Android devices, Google Meet might have been number one in downloads, right? Because most people didn't have to download because they had it already, right? Um, but this shows that people were uh, consuming uh, technology for education. Companies that were ready a little bit like Zoom uh, or Slack from Salesforce, showed uh, this is this is the share price increase of zoom it increased by four times that's yes 400 percent uh from um in 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 just about one year right so uh, companies that were better prepared for that or that had better tools uh, made a lot huge amount of money with the pandemic and the new normal became blended learning which was uh, even the concept of blended learning was probably redefined. I don't know about you, but uh, I, I had a different idea of blended learning. And many people used to think that blended learning was when students learned partly at home and partly at school, right? Uh, but now we see that blended learning can happen and does happen when and kids can learn at home and at home right so blended learning was redefined to be uh to to meaning changing synchronously or asynchronously with the teacher face to face a live class or uh, uh learning from pre-recorded lessons right and we saw that blended learning is here to stay uh perhaps this is what we have as most schools prepare to start classes right now. Yeah, we, we got to consider the impacts of blended learning. But in this movement of uh, online teaching, right, there are some trends that uh, I would like to discuss with you. And perhaps if we, uh, something else occurs to me, perhaps uh, I know uh, some people who are teachers, you probably know many in, in, in yourself. Um, what really worries me and in, in the topic of uh, the idea of getting the best out, out of us all is that perhaps uh, technology went online, but it was basically doing the same thing it did in face-to-face -face classes, or at least schools wanted it to do, some schools, right? 
wanted it to do the same thing it did in face-to-face -face classes. Some schools kept the same schedule, the same hours, meaning students would stay in front of the computer from 7.30 p.m. a.m., I'm sorry, to 4 p.m. in some cases. Like no more, <laughs> nothing less than seven or eight hours per day in front of the computer, which is insane, right? This is uh, not using tech, the, the best everything technology can offer you, right? Uh, that means overexposure to screens and lots of other uh, problems that may have even physical, social and emotional problems. But some trends emerged out of uh, this chaos that I thought it would be worthy this, worth discussing with you. Right? Some of these trends were already in place, and perhaps they are more characteristic of uh, Education 4.0 or ELT, English Language Teaching 4.0, not only because of the pandemic, but uh, of course, uh, the pandemic prepared uh, the world in a way for these trends that accelerated things, right? Because you cannot motivate the student uh, online if the content is not relevant, right? He won't even open his camera. So we gotta have active learning. Students must be actively involved in the process. And we can do that even with the use of technology and perhaps especially with the use of technology. Uh, it, I mean, active learning is not the same thing of collaborative learning, right? One thing is to be active, uh, Pair work or group work does not mean collaborative work, right? Collaborate means uh, students uh, interact, they work together for the knowledge construction. They, they, they build, they construct knowledge together, right? So if there is a group activity in which uh, knowledge construction is not the main focus of that activity, then this teaching is not really interactive, right? And this is one of the characteristics of uh, Education 4.0, to construct knowledge together. Look at the child as a whole, right? The whole child education, looking at physical, social, cognitive, and emotional aspects of the child. Looking to him as an individual, not only as a student who will reproduce things. That's why social and emotional learning grows uh, during this period. Um, mindfulness uh, increases its use in technology in, in, in class. People start thinking of brain breaks or checkpoints to see if students are understanding. And uh, that changed uh, the dynamics of how we look into students. Critical thinking as well uh, as uh, an important point. This was already uh, a very important topic before, but with the advancement of technology, it becomes even more important in a world of fake news, right? In a world in which students have to learn how to doubt, in which many people want to hear more from what they already believe, right? Some people will only uh, watch the news in certain channels because they only believe in that, right? When it should be the opposite, right? So just to give you one example, if you are a Democrat, if you are a Democrat in the United States, uh, I don't know, I did that exercise. I would hear the news from Fox News sometimes to get the other view and to be able to, to exercise critical thinking. And then I would listen to CNN to see what was the counter argument. And then I would have my own conclusions, right? So you learn to doubt, to check the facts. So we got to help students use facts and data uh, when, they, when, they, when they produce their writings or, or speaking, uh, whatever. Uh, so students uh, need to learn how to think critically. And this is an important uh, trend for the 21st century education. Uh, moving on and going deeper in this idea of... Uh, learning with technology, thriving with technology. This is a time of learning by doing. It's the time in which people learn by watching a video on YouTube, right? STEM uh, disciplines are 
being taught uh, more and more nowadays are gaining in importance. People teaching science, technology, engineering, and math. And guess what? English is in many cases the language chosen for teaching these subjects, which is amazing, right? STEM projects are part of bilingual programs or um, uh, courses in general. STEAM, including arts as well, uh, is also a growing trend. And these are all things students are learning by doing. Uh, they are producing uh, wonderful projects. And this uh, teaching and this learning of the 21st century, post-pandemic learning, has to solve uh, the problems of the world. If learning does not solve the world's problem, then it's not real world context, right? It's not authentic. So authenticity changes from uh, using material that natives that was produced for native speakers. Okay, I know that. But pretty much if you turn YouTube on nowadays, if you open YouTube, you will find authentic material. I mean... Um, Everything should be authentic nowadays. Authenticity for me, real life context. I mean, not only not not for me. Uh, it's uh, what uh, 21st century uh, teaching guidelines say is um, students must produce solutions for the world and they must deliver these solutions for people who can implement them. So uh, making a project or building something only for showing the teacher, it's not enough. Right, that has to be put uh, into the hands of someone who can implement that solution. Then, it, or um, a science fair, or uh, it could be uh, I don't know a, a competition, a, a prize competition, or perhaps something for him to use at home. I don't know, but something must be useful for the world. Maker spaces are taking place all over, in which students have to build things in schools. Uh, augmented and virtual reality are trends for this post-pandemic world in which um, students can be immersed in a virtual world to learn with it, be it using virtual reality glasses or a screen or an app or uh, whatever. Virtual reality will uh, take to students to other places where they would never be to learn with them. Uh, on the other hand, augmented reality will increase the information students receive from his own world. He will learn things that wouldn't be possible without technology from his world, from his city, from a landmark in his uh, city or from uh, a park or um, some historic uh, building or, or place, he will learn more about his reality or he will dive into a virtual reality. Uh, this should be part of education nowadays. If you have heard people saying that we should start learning Chinese, how about that? How about starting uh, to learn coding, right? Coding is the new second language. People believe that cod coding comes second right after English, right? So if your students or if your programs include coding, I think you are on the way to go. If your children or students are learning how to code, <clears throat> chances are they are going to use these skills in the future, right? They are going to use this to program the machines they are going to use. Um, and as we approach the final part of our lesson, the final quarter of uh, of this talk i would like to hear a little bit more from you and that gives me some time to breathe as well i want you to go back to menti.com again get your smartphones and this will be the last time okay i promise don't get desperate don't get angry right uh wow 129 people have voted thank you very much for your participation guys third and last question after all these things we heard I'd like to hear a few more words for you. After all that was said and, and done, if you could define the future of education in three words, what would these words be after all that? I would like to have your view of education as well, of the future of education and the way we're headed. 
how would you define it? If you could use only three key words, what would they be for the future of education? So get your smartphones, guys. Uh, all you have to do is to go to the next uh, question there. Oops. Uh, I, I know it takes some time and there is a delay in, while I talk. Okay, promising, transforming. Let's see. Wow. Lots of wonderful ideas. Collaboration in the center. It appears twice in there. Right. More answers are coming. Innovation is there. Critical thinking as well. Fantastic. Well, technology is growing bigger. Collaboration is as big as technology now. Uh, and the, the bigger the word, it means the more times it has appeared in your entries, guys. So I think technology is winning. Challenging is also a big idea there. Collaborative as well. Empathy. I like that. I like autonomy as well. It is challenging. It's collaborative. Well, collaborative and collaboration are quite similar. So, well, fantastic. 55 entries. Collaboration is in the center now. Perhaps as big as technology. Fantastic. Way to go, guys. Thank you for your entries. That's amazing. It's great to see. And this is our view. This, this group's view of uh, technology, right? So more people are entering. Wow. More than 70 people have entered now. And I hope you can see it uh, on the screen so you can see it moving. So I'm going to do the following. As many people have voted. So I'm going to hide my screen for, from you so you don't see it now because I want to show you uh, at the end. And then we can have a little surprise. But guys, uh, in the final seven minutes of my talk, I would like to talk about how we can explore the full potential of ICT tools. Um, the whole point here is doing things differently from we did in the past. Uh, as I mentioned before, many schools or teachers, when we went online, they expected the virtual reality to be a control V, control C of, um, of their classes, right? If students used to do a certain kind of test, the test would have to look exactly the same uh, on the computer. Uh, if classes had a certain amount of minutes or time, they would have the same time and the same dynamics online. But guys, we can do a lot more online. We can move beyond that. Uh, if technology does not serve for knowledge construction, if technological devices are only reproducing um, paper or if digital books only replace books for the same end, for the same purpose, then they are not necessarily uh, important for, for talk. If they are not used for knowledge construction, you see, we've gone through those steps. In the beginning, it was access and motivation. People would feel, people would feel yay, we're going to use technology. Then we would go online for social socializing. We would exchange information, but now knowledge construction uh, if ICT is used for language construction, then it means uh, it is relevant nowadays. How about computer labs, guys? What, what to do with them? They are disappearing in schools. What should you do with them? Well, uh, turns out computers have gone into the classroom, right? Uh, the stu students are with computers in class. These are Chromebooks, for example. This is a school from Brazil. I wanted to make sure... I got a, a class from Brazil here to show you, right? Uh, and the pandemic made possible some things that perhaps weren't in the few in the past. The idea of bring your own device, which is thinkable nowadays. Many students had to use their own devices at home. So perhaps the pandemic made it possible to have a BYOD policy in which students bring their own devices into class. Uh, for schools who want to invest in technology, cloud computing made things a lot easier, right? In the past, you would have to have a computer lab with uh, 
desktops with an operational system with uh, ed with text processors um, with um, a spreadsheet program with presentations now all you need is an email address to access all that and you don't need storage anymore in a computer you can store all that in the cloud and that made things easier and more collaborative between students as well so turn those uh, computer labs into maker spaces turn them into workshops why not right let students produce things in them smartphones are always in hand so why not have uh, smartphones in class this was the number one device voted there in our first poll even though little kids learn better with tablets right uh, this is the best device if i had an elementary school and i would invest in technology it would be tablets tablets for for little kids up until uh, age 10 basically and then after that um, uh, computers or chromebooks or two-in-one devices in which are uh, touch sensitive and also um, computers but um, to finish with a silver lining some ways for professional developments uh, this time there are lots of free courses that are low cost for teachers teacher certifications offered by google uh, by apple or microsoft big tech companies uh, offering free content and certification which is either either free or very low cost for teachers which is available for us online so we can gain this expertise online teaching methodologies like esap developed by pearson find out more about that go esap online on google engage study activate practice it's a teaching methodology for online teaching we cannot expect online teaching to be uh, the same as face-to-face -face teaching and to conclude guys i would like to finish i would like to close with the words of solomon ken the founder of ken academy can you see the pyramid he's making and perhaps this will will tie all the loose ends from from my um, poor speech sorry uh he says that uh, in the industrial society the purpose of uh, education would be to prepare people for um working in the factories and for perhaps operating machines in factories building things or uh it would be to form the middle class uh to this to to perform their jobs while we had a little bit uh, the tip of the pyramid would be landowners or aristocrats or the owners of capital which would uh, rule or administer everything but with technology and the times we live uh, with tools like Ken Academy, for example, that Salman Ken invented, uh, came up with. We can, we, what we live, what we experiment nowadays is an inversion of the pyramid. And perhaps um, the majority of those jobs which working class would do, and some of the jobs the middle class would do in the past, they will be done by computers or with the help of computers with so in such a way that the pyramid is inverted and the largest number of people nowadays uh, the working class will have to use those computers for creating new new things because mechanical or 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 hand made jobs or will be done by computers automatic jobs so why not why not uh aiding helping this uh generation to produce and to be um creators to thrive in this world this is the idea and i know this is possible i know we can do that by uh, using the full potential of uh, technology so thank you very much for coming i hope uh technology in the chaos will finally get the best out of us thank you very much Thank you for coming. If you don't know how to do that, move fast, take risks. It's okay to try big things. You're better off trying something and having it not work and learning from then 
than having not done anything at all, right? It's much better try and take risk. If you don't know how to do it, try it, do it, because using the tools is that you will mature with them and you will learn how to use them better as in the examples we've seen. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, Fernando. Hi, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining us. If you need your certificates, the link to download it is on the video description. And I'll see you there on our next lecture presented by Lucero Aguilar talking about quarantine teaching uh, right now at 5 p.m. Brazilian time. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye bye.